went to the internet to look up the definition of functional medicine. And instead of a clear definition, what I found was a blooming, buzzing confusion. So what is functional medicine? Well, the best answer I could come up with was Ibthoom. I-B-T-H-O-O-M stands for it beats the hell out of me. <laughs> Now, when you look up a medical term, usually you find a clear-cut definition. If you look up cardiology, it says a cardiology is the branch of medicine that deals with diseases and abnormalities of the heart. When you look up functional medicine, instead of a definition, what you get are descriptions. And there are a lot of different descriptions. In fact, uh, there seem to be as many different descriptions as there are people doing the describing. And uh, it's like Humpty Dumpty. It seems to mean whatever they choose it to mean. And in reality, functional medicine is not a legitimate medical category. It's a marketing term that uh, really um, gives them an excuse to mix, to mix imaginary medicine and real medicine and do whatever they want to do and just uh, make things up and make it up as they go along. This guy invented functional medicine. His name is Jeffrey Bland. He's not a medical doctor, he's a PhD, and he sells dietary supplements. And his diet supplement companies have been in trouble repeatedly with the FTC and the FDA. They've had to pay fines, and they've been ordered to stop making medical claims for their products. But uh, Jeffrey Bland invented functional medicine, and a lot of people adopted it. You might say they jumped on the Bland wagon. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is one of the most famous ones who's done that, uh, Mark Hyman. He is a medical doctor, but he also sells dietary supplements, and he sells detox cleanses. And um, he's written some questionable books. One of them is the... Uh, the blood sugar solution, a 10-day detox diet. Another one is the Daniel Plan, which he co-wrote with a pastor, and it's a diet based on biblical principles. And he holds some rather strange beliefs. He's a germ theory denialist. He says germs don't cause disease, it's not the germs, it's the terrain. And he has said that the laws of thermodynamics don't apply in the human body. <laughs> and he says that uh, modern medicine is as obsolete as phrenology and bloodletting. So in my opinion, neither of these guys uh, inspire as much confidence, but I want to be scrupulously fair and give them every chance to explain just what it is they think they're doing with functional medicine. And what better place to look than their own organization, the Institute for Functional Medicine? And this is what you find on that website. You needn't try to read it all now because I'll be breaking it down for you. But for now, just notice how long it is. This is not a simple definition of what functional medicine is. It's a description of what functional medicine does. And it's a vague description. But the big problem is it does not explain how functional medicine is really any different from good conventional medicine. And you could draw a line through the words functional medicine in every place it's mentioned in this statement and replace it with the words conventional medicine and it would be just as true, probably truer. So let's try that and see what happens. Okay. Um, Conventional medicine addresses the underlying causes of disease. It always has. If you have appendicitis, they don't just treat the pain with, with morphine. <clears throat> they remove the cause of the pain. They remove your appendix where, where the, that was causing the pain in the first place. And a lot of times we don't really understand the underlying cause of the disease. And in that case, the functional medicine people make one up. And their underlying causes are generally speculative and uh, maybe even imaginary. Okay, a systems-oriented approach. Now, um, 
systems oriented means taking into account how different body systems interact with each other. For instance, we know that the uh, nervous system has an effect on the functioning of the GI tract. And uh, the functional medicine people try to uh, try to apply the functional, the systems-oriented system where, where it really doesn't apply. You don't need to talk about systems-oriented approach for setting a broken bone. And uh, engaging both the patient and practitioner in a therapeutic partnership. Well, doctors always do that. We don't have paternalistic medicine anymore. And uh, conventional medicine better addresses the healthcare needs of the 21st century. We're improving all the time through science, and I don't see that functional medicine has anything to add to that. And addresses the whole person. Well, good medicine has always done that. Even back in ancient Greece, Hippocrates said it's more important to know what kind of person has the disease than what kind of disease the person has. And, um, Conventional medicine addresses the whole person. We even have a, a um, standard part of the medical history that looks at, at um, societal factors, family history, and uh, social factors. And conventional medicine, doctors have to spend time with their patients because the history is 70% of the diagnostic process. And uh, sometimes the Functional medicine people have more time to spend with their patients, but they don't put it to very good use. Okay, uh, looking at the interactions between genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors that influence long-term health. Well, conventional medicine does that. Um, for instance, in diabetes, doctors think about things like family history, diet, weight, environmental factors, smoking, blood pressure, stress, and exercise. So really, um, functional medicine is no different from good conventional medicine. What it is is a variant of so-called integrative medicine. And you may have heard what Mark Krislip had to say about integrative medicine, but even if you have, it's worth saying again. It says, if you integrate fantasy with reality, you do not instantiate reality. If you mix cow pie with apple pie, it does not make the cow pie taste better, it makes the apple pie worse. <laughs> and integrative medicine is not a scientific concept, it's a marketing ploy designed to infiltrate quackery into real medicine. So here's why the functional medicine folks say we need functional medicine. One, the incidence of chronic disease is rising. Well. Yes, it is, and that's partly because conventional medicine is keeping people alive long enough to develop those chronic diseases. And uh, we're getting better and better at preventing and treating those diseases through science. We don't need anything extra from functional medicine to do that. Two, medicine is oriented to acute care. But if you have an acute problem like a broken bone, uh, acute care is entirely appropriate. Three, the acute care approach is inappropriate for chronic diseases. Well, duh. <laughs> we don't treat chronic diseases with an acute care approach. We treat them with a chronic care approach. Four, there's a huge gap between research and the way doctors practice. And that's true, and that's why there's a movement in medicine uh, towards evidence-based medicine to try to narrow that gap. And really what functional medicine people are doing is increasing that gap because they go beyond the evidence when the evidence is still preliminary and questionable. Five, physicians are not adequately trained in, to prevent chronic illnesses with nutrition, diet, and exercise. Well, that's a lie. Uh, it was physicians who invented prevention Functional medicine tends to think that diet and lifestyle can cure everything. They, they go way beyond the evidence. And they haven't proven that they're any better at carrying out proven preventive measures like vaccines. Now, here's another explanation from a functional medicine doctor named Alex Reinhardt. 
He says, functional medicine is not focused on diagnosis. It sees health as a continuum, unique testing and predictive advice, identification of suboptimum function, personalized lifestyle medicine, dynamic balance of mind, body, and spirit, and promotion of organ reserve. And then he goes on to explain that functional medicine addresses these seven core imbalances. They pretty much cover the spectrum. Now, I wonder, how do you think they managed to detect all of these imbalances, and how do you suppose they managed to correct them? Uh, in Mark Hyman's TED talk, here's what he said. He said, diseases don't exist. They're just downstream symptoms of a mechanism. And modern medicine is dysfunctional. And functional medicine is the opposite. Functional medicine is personalized medicine, and it asks why rather than what. Here's a pictorial explanation. Functional medicine targets these chronic diseases at the top of the picture, like diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. And the underlying causes under the surface are all these different kinds of imbalances, along with toxic chemical exposures and toxic emotions. You know, toxic emotions cause a lot of diseases. Um, and here's the functional medicine tree. You won't be able to read this, but I'll break it down. The leaves are symptoms, conventional diagnoses, organ systems, and medical specialties. The soil is sleep, exercise, nutrition, stress levels, relationships, and genetics. The roots are antecedents, triggers, mediators, mental, emotional, and spiritual influences, genetic predisposition, experiences, attitudes, and beliefs. And the tree trunk is these fundamental organizing systems, assimilation, defense, energy, biotransformation, communication, transport, and structural integrity. And then there's another scheme that takes those seven items from the tree trunk and puts them around a core of mental, emotional, and spiritual factors. Now, do you think this is a really practical way of organizing medical information about a patient and of guiding treatment? I don't. Uh, functional medicine subscribes to a lot of myths. They have the idea that diet and lifestyle will prevent and treat almost all diseases. They say normal isn't enough, we should aim for something better than normal. And they treat non-diseases like yeast, adrenal fatigue, toxicity that requires detoxification, and leaky gut. And remember Jeffrey Bland, who invented functional medicine? Well, he doesn't even mention most of the items on that tree. He says these are the five foundational principles of the functional medicine approach. Correct the precipitating factor and control oxidative stress. Get rid of the sources of chronic inflammation. Manage the folate cycle regulate hormones, and manage insulin and control blood sugar. So after all these different explanations, are you getting a clear idea of what functional medicine is, or are you just getting more? Do you, do you think functional medicine can actually accomplish all that it promises? Do you think there's any evidence that uh, all these vague principles lead to practical interventions that actually work to improve health and, and prevent chronic disease. Well, as the late Wallace Sampson said, none of this functional medicine lays out a map from which one can get from here to there. There are claims cloaked in the language of science, but with the distinguishing characteristics of sectarianism, pluralities of approaches to illness, absence of evidence for efficacy, a unifying concept of illness as a body out of sync with nature, with the capital N, undecipherable babble, and descriptive word salad. And I have to agree. It seems to me that there's no there there. Now, some of them admit that they don't really have good evidence for all that they do, but they explain that inconvenient fact away. Their excuse is that research can't test each individualized patient-centered therapeutic plan that is tailored to a person with a unique combination of existing conditions, genetic influences, environmental exposures, and lifestyle choices. Clinical trials have many inherent limitations. Now, I have one word for this uh, excuse. 
bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it would be a very simple matter to randomize patients into two groups and have one group treated with functional medicine and the other group treated with conventional medicine and see which group does better. And to my knowledge, no such study has ever been done. So all this is very confusing, and none of it really tells us what happens when a patient goes into the functional medicine doctor's office. But they helpfully provide case reports. Uh, they publish cases describing what they do. And presumably the ones that they publish are their best cases that uh, really speak well for what they're doing. So let's look at a couple of those case reports. First, there was a woman who had menopausal symptoms, hot flashes and so on. She went to her conventional doctor and he didn't do any tests because no tests were indicated. And he put her on a prescription hormone, an estrogen called estrace, and it worked. Her hot flashes went away. But she was suspicious of big pharma and she was worried about side effects. Now what she should have done was to go, to go back to the doctor that prescribed estrace and, and ask him about her concerns and he could have reassured her based on the published evidence. But instead she defected. She went to a functional medicine doctor and he did a, a bunch of non-standard hormone tests and he found that she had a hormone imbalance with too much estrogen. Well, remember she's taking prescription estrogen. Um, and he, he made up a special bioidentical hormone just for her that was made by a compounding pharmacy. And it worked. She had no menopausal symptoms, but then she didn't have any menopausal symptoms on the prescription estrogen either. And she also lost 54 pounds and had increased energy. And they don't explain how she lost the weight, uh, I'm certain that, that the bioidentical hormones didn't have anything to do with it. There's, there's no way that they would make you lose weight. And if she lost that much weight, it's no wonder that she had increased energy. Um, and now, I don't see that they did anything that a conventional doctor could, couldn't have done. The conventional doctor could have switched her to a bioidentical hormone. But if he was rigorously science-based, he wouldn't have done that because there's no evidence that bioidentical hormones are any safer or any more effective. And plus, uh, there are some quality control problems with those compounding pharmacies. The, uh, the FDA has issued warnings about them recently because of some poisoning cases. So, so far I'm not impressed. I, I don't see where they did all those special things they claim to do. Um, and here's another, this is perhaps the best example of all. This is a case study that was published in an integrative medicine journal. And it beautifully illustrates the functional medicine approach, and it also illustrates the functional medicine misconception of what constitutes adequate evidence. But David Gorski wrote up this case for the Science-Based Medicine blog, and it's a doozy. This was an 80-year-old woman with breast cancer, and they gave her chemotherapy to shrink the cancer, and then they did surgery, and they removed the cancer. And they probably, the surgery probably cured her. She had an excellent prognosis, but they offered her extra added insurance in the form of post-operative radiation. She refused the post-operative radiation, but that probably didn't make much difference. And she did well. Two years later, there were no signs of recurrence, which is just exactly what you would expect. Now, to my mind, this is a clear case of conventional medicine doing a fantastic job. But the functional medicine people got into the act and they did a bunch of other stuff and then they tried to take the credit. They gave her intravenous vitamin C, 97 infusions. They started with 25 grams and worked up to 75 grams. Now, you need to know that the tolerable upper limit of vitamin C is two grams a day. So they were giving her massive toxic doses of vitamin C. Why vitamin C? Well, they admit in their write-up that the use of, vit of IV vitamin C therapy in cancer remains controversial, although some preliminary trials have shown IV vitamin C to be safe and 
potentially effective in improving quality of life and fatigue in patients with cancer. Now, do you suppose that's what they told the patient? I suspect not. Uh, and they left her on her prescription medications and they added all these supplements, uh, including, if you notice, uh, one of the items is oral vitamin C, in addition to all the intravenous vitamin C she was already getting. And they gave her a standardized herbal inflammation relief supplement, whatever the heck that is. Uh, they put her on a diet with a low glycemic index, dairy-free, gluten-free. They had her exercise 10 minutes a day on a bicycle and do Qigong classes. They put her on a sleep program, which consisted of instructions and a log to record her sleep. And they provided support in the uh, guise of counseling, group support, and a part-time caregiver. And then the lab tests. 154 lab tests, most of, most of which I have never heard of. Um, they, they did things like putrefactive single-chain fatty acids, urine representativeness index. I mean, what on earth are those things? Um, the Genova Laboratory did the Nutrival panel that had 140 tests. And Genova is a rather disreputable lab that is known for using uh, bogus tests. So they did all these tests, and in most cases, the results were within the laboratory reference range. And if they weren't within that range, you wouldn't know what to do about it or even if anything needed to be done. And uh, they claim that these tests were used in the management of the patient, but they don't offer any explanation of how. One finding was that the manganese level was just slightly above the upper limit of the, of the uh, reference range. So friggin' what? <laughs> and the author's conclusions, they said, this case study highlights the potential benefits of integrative therapy in the co-management of patients with invasive ductal carcinoma of the breast. Highlights the potential benefits? It does no such thing. It's nothing but an anecdote describing all the silly things they were able to get away with. So this is what passes for treatment success and for publishable evidence in functional medicine. What a travesty. They didn't help this 80-year-old woman. They tortured her. They, she had to travel to the clinic 97 times to get needle sticks and get toxic amounts of vitamin C. They restricted her diet and kept her from enjoying the foods that she liked. And she had to buy a lot of useless dietary supplements. And insurance doesn't pay for all these things the functional medicine people did, so they were costing, costing her a lot of money. And there is no reason to think that anything that they did improved her outcome. So how does this case illustrate what they claim to do? Did they look for the underlying cause of her cancer or her high blood pressure, her gastritis, or her thyroid disease? Did they consider genetics in the environment? Did they correct the seven core imbalances? Did they address Bland's five foundational principles? Did they use the best evidence-based practices? I think it's clear that they're not doing what they claim to be doing. Now, Wally Sampson wrote a series of articles for science-based medicine, and he said, I finally see what functional medicine really is a non-scientific, ineffective, jingoistic, cultic approach to dysfunctional somatoform non-disease conditions, or non-treatments for non-disease. <laughs> David Gorsky's conclusion was, what's good about functional medicine is not unique, and what's unique about it is not good. It takes making it up as you go along to a whole new level, and that's not a good thing in medicine. And for my conclusion, I'll just show you a picture. They say a picture's <laughs> worth a thousand words. Thank you. <laughs>